Welcome to another episode of Bitcoin Tech Talk. As always, you can find my newsletter at jimmysong.substack.com. Why you should run a full node, Bitcoin Tech Talk, issue number 251. Bitcoiners like to say, verify, don't trust. This is not just lip service, as thousands of users all over the world run full nodes. Unfortunately, the full node narrative has been maligned to death by many people, especially all coiners who say such verification is unimportant. Even among a lot of Bitcoiners, the reasons for running a full node are not entirely clear. Some say it's so that you can relay transactions on the network. Others say it decentralizes the Bitcoin network, and still others say it's a way to keep miners honest. These are all true to a degree, but ultimately running a full node is at the heart of what makes Bitcoin trustless. One of the remarkable properties of Bitcoin is that every transaction is recorded on its ledger, which we call the blockchain. Unfortunately, that term too has been corrupted to mean some magical, naturally decentralized database when it's really nothing of the kind. The reason why we run full nodes is so that we don't have to trust anyone. To understand why this is important, we need to look at the problem with centralized systems. Centralized systems are, in general, very fast and quick to upgrade and so on. Unfortunately, they also introduce a single point of failure, which is ripe for abuse both inside and outside the system. From the outside, government regulators can add onerous rules to hurt the entire system. From the inside, the controllers of a centralized system can embezzle or abuse the resources that are entrusted to them. Indeed, this is the problem with centralization, which is that trust is required, and given sufficient time, that trust is always abused. This is most obvious with where we store our money, banks. Banks abuse the trust of their depositors by lending more money than they had entrusted to them or fractional reserve lending. This created more profits for the bankers with the risk uh, going to their depositors. The trust in a centralized entity created a moral hazard which got taken advantage of. The big difference with Bitcoin's design is that every transaction is continually under scrutiny. Fractional reserve lending is not possible because everyone running a full node will catch it. There is no trust involved, but continuous verification. That verification process is useful to the network from a game theory perspective, but the main reason to run a full node is for the benefit of the user. By running a full node, users don't have to trust anyone. They can verify for themselves that the transaction is legit and that they are, getting, uh, they, and that they are not getting screwed. Users uh, that are trusting some entity, such as a block explorer or their wallet software server, are trusting someone. Running a full node allows you to verify everything yourself. This, in turn, makes the Bitcoin network decentralized. You have complete ownership over your Bitcoin, and that cannot be overruled by anyone. This is in stark contrast to the fiat system or altcoins. Being centralized, those services very much can take away your Bitcoins in the next hard fork or in the next few in the few nodes that are running. Sure, many haven't, but the vulnerability has been and will continue to be there. In short, run a full node so you don't have to trust anyone and be subject to their malice and or incompetence. Um, that last line comes from uh, the definition of trust um, that I read a while back. Um, there are two things that you have to trust in order to really trust somebody, and that is their competence and their integrity. Um, so it is possible uh, for someone to be competent, but be malicious and therefore take advantage or somebody to be, uh, to have integrity, but be incompetent, in which case, you know, you're also vulnerable. And that's, that's the main thing that we're protecting against malice and incompetence in, in any sort of centralized system. And, you know, with, with our government and the current uh, monetary uh, system, um, you know, that both uh, are there to some degree. There is certainly a lot of embezzling of funds and so on. Um, uh, but there's also, uh, you know, incompetence, in, in right? Like they, they do things uh, just because they think it'll work when it, they have no proof that it will or, you know, it backfires on them and so on. And, you know, we've also seen this in a lot of altcoins too, guys, uh, where we have lots of incompetence, a lot of developers that don't know what they're doing that introduce bugs that cause vulnerabilities and so on. Um, and also malice, a lot, a lot of these uh, places, you know, uh, embezzle funds or use it to uh, use, you know, like their central, um, uh, you know, pre-mine to, you know, do vacations for themselves and so on. So, um, all that is to say Bitcoin fixes those problems and this is, uh, but you know, it doesn't work unless you're running a full node. You, you don't, you still have to trust somebody the minute you use a block explorer or, um, you know, like some other server or something like that. And this is why you should run your own full node that, you know, is good. 
A new paper looks at the efficacy of various mixing techniques. The paper is quite thorough in its evaluation with over 20 different mixing techniques being examined on criteria like Sybil resistance and value privacy. Many of these techniques were ones I hadn't heard before, so it was great for learning some of these things. The paper's main conclusion seems to be that a lot of coin joint techniques need greater anonymity sets, and that value shuffle in particular looks promising. The paper is worth studying just to get a good idea of the options available. So um, there are over like 20 different techniques for uh, coin joining or anonymizing your Bitcoin. And they looked at each one for sort of the level of privacy that they gave, get you, and they examined it on a uh, pretty objective criteria. Uh, paper definitely worth reading. It's downloadable as a PDF uh, by some academic uh, and you know published by academics. Ledger takes a look at the security of software wallets. The article is very thorough in its analysis of vulnerabilities, depending on whether the wallet is on a computer or on a phone. The main thing I learned from the article is that key storage software doesn't support the cryptographic algorithms necessary to make signing secure, so the keys must be accessed by the app. Thus, almost any device that's compromised will likely leak the private key. The other thing is that phones are better at isolating the private key. Worth reading if you if making a software wallet. So. Phones have a secure element um, and you can sort of like isolate the key there. And even if your device is compromised, um, it, you know, the malware may not be able to get to that area. Although if it has root access, then, you know, all bets are off. So, uh, but, you know, very interesting, um, uh, you know, they're, they're, they obviously have some stake in this as their hardware wallet vendor and they, uh, want to FUD uh, software wallets uh, a little bit, but I, I, I think it's a it's a fair article, and I, I I thought the points that they made were good. Lightning coin shares as an investor's primer on the Lightning network. Uh, the rationale, benefits, and current status are all examined fairly, and makes for a good. Uh, <clears throat> Oh, wait, 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 I missed one. Join Market has a new release that finally incorporates Fidelity Bonds. The idea is to make coin join civil resistant by forcing time locks of Bitcoin. You can read more about Fidelity Bonds here. This is a very clever way of making traceability more expensive through locking up Bitcoins. I do wonder whether anonymity sets will be big enough in such cases, though for holders, time lock aspect is probably a positive. So... Um, join Market is a uh, coin join protocol and... Uh, you know, the, the big vulnerability is Sybil attack. So you can have, uh, you know, one entity put in like most of the coin join. Um, and then that way you are, um, you, you, you know, they can trace who you are because they take up most of it uh, and know which output you have and so on. Um, by incorporating fidelity bonds, basically they're a way to either pledge some money or lock up your money for some time. And they're going up with going with the you know least uh, destructive option, which is locking up your money for some amount of time. Um, you know they make it very expensive for somebody because they need access to the actual bitcoins in order to to do it. So that's what the fidelity bonds are. It's a very good way to um, add civil resistance, and I hope uh, other coin joint protocols add it. CoinShares as an investor's primer on the Lightning Network, the rational benefits, and the cur and current status are all examined fairly and makes for a good uh, makes for a good case for its usefulness. It's too bad so many hedge funds and VCs write such reports for all coins that have almost no usage because they want to pump their own bags. For this reason, CoinShares deserves more than their usual kudos, more than the usual kudos for not obviously talking their book. So, um, you know, th th this sort of report is uh, is common among VCs and so on who. Uh, want to get other people to invest in bags that they already hold and so on. Uh, but CoinShares is doing that for Lightning and there are no bags to pump. There's no uh, you know alternate token or anything like that. Instead, it's just, um, hey, here's the Lightning network and here's stuff that you can build on it. I, I, I see this as uh, a, a less... Uh, you know, morally hazardous uh, uh, thing than what other VCs are doing. So I'll read the report, send it to people that don't understand Lightning. Um, and it's, it's a good way to understand why it's so important for Bitcoin. Coin Corner compares Lightning Network's energy usage to daily tasks. The article is brilliant in its practical comparisons. They compare tasks like sending email, running an electric vehicle, visiting websites, or using the traditional banking system to the equivalent on the Lightning Network. Let's just say that the people complaining about Bitcoin's energy usage are the pot to Bitcoin's kettle. So yeah, it's uh, 
uh, really kind of a clever way to examine all of these other activities. Um, you know, it turns out sending email or visiting websites, uh, you know, uses as much or more energy than the Lightning Network. So there you go. A uh, new paper looks at the interest rates available on Lightning. They ran their own routing node and compared the cost versus the revenue they made and projected that to other nodes on the network. Unsurprisingly, given the nascent nature of the network, they found that even the biggest nodes with the fattest channels are not making very much, less than 0.1%. But they predict that fees will increase as the network grows. This will be something to keep an eye on, and I hope the authors do a follow-up study every few years to show trends going forward. So um, there is sort of like a natural rate of interest on Lightning uh, by running a routing node, because uh, I mean, there, there is some risk because you're, you're putting it online and the keys have to be online and so on. Uh, but you're, uh, you're providing a service to other people by providing liquidity, and that in turn means that you get paid for it. Uh, but a, a lot of times like that payment uh, isn't very much compared to the cost, and that's that's what they point out in the paper. Um, but you know they expected uh, uh, the fees to um, be more profitable as as the network grows. Economics, engineering, etc. Peter Saint Onge argues that a Bitcoin ban would skyrocket its price. Having been in the bit, having been in Bitcoin a long time, I tend to agree with this view. Oftentimes, like in 2013 with Ross Ulbricht's arrest, and 2017 with the BCH split. What's perceived as an unfavorable event is actually really good for Bitcoin. In a sense, once a bullet has been fired and doesn't hurt Bitcoin, the market seems to react by rewarding Bitcoin with a higher price. Um, and I, I would argue that, that that already has kind of happened uh, as well in China. They've more or less banned Bitcoin in many ways. Um, and that's been good for Bitcoin's price as Bitcoin sort of takes the hit and keeps going. It's kind of like a puncher receiving the best punch from the other uh, <coughs> the other, uh, you know, uh, uh, from their opponent and then like not getting rocked. And then, you know, it like makes the other guy scared. Oh, oh crap. I gave him my best punch and he's still not knocked down. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, like surviving is basically what Bitcoin does and it shows that it's anti-fragile to it. Arthur Hayes gives reasons for optimism in a pretty dull trade summer trading season. He argues that the only thing that really matters for Bitcoin price is the monetary expansion of fiat money. His analysis of the Fed, PBOC, and ECB point to some serious money printing still going on, and his conclusion is that these chickens will be coming home to roost. I agree with him that we're set for an insane fall after an underperforming summer. Um, so yeah, this summer, you know, it's kind of the doldrums, and this is kind of what happened in 2013. A lot of people are on vacation and so on. The price action on Bitcoin tends to happen in the spring or the fall. Uh, we certainly had our spring thing. Um, I, I'm expecting something like a fall thing. And, you know, I think his analysis is right. The only thing you should look at is the monetary expansion of the other assets. We already know what Bitcoin supply is. It's, uh, it's really the other stuff that's moving. And, you know, uh, the other stuff is moving. Let's just say that. Tomer Strolide argues uh, that Bitcoin hits at the core of what it means to be human. He argues that trade is at the heart of being a part of society and the reason why morality needs to exist. The main insight I got out of the article is that by manipulating money, governments can and do corrupt morality for their own benefit. Bitcoin is the antidote as it's a money that's not manipulable by a central authority. And, uh, you know, the article is uh, longer than that, uh, but that trade piece and that being like a large part of being in a community, I thought was a very good point. Jake Chervinsky has a nice tweet thread summarizing what's wrong with the Bitcoin provisions in the infrastructure bill. This is something of a moving target as the text continues to change as they resolve differences between the House and the Senate. I do think that as a community, we're going to have to start paying for better representation. Coin Center didn't have a clue this was coming and, we're represent and they're representing all coins a lot more these days. In any case, here are some things that you can do right now. So I was pretty disappointed that this came through last minute. Um, nobody had a clue that this was coming, especially not Coin Center. Um, and you know, they're, they're sort of the quote unquote lobbying group. I, I really do think that we need a Bitcoin only lobbying group in Washington that uh, you know, focuses on Bitcoin's interests instead of all these altcoins. Um, and you know, maybe something will be happening soon. Gallup has published a new poll on Bitcoin ownership in the US and the trends around the 6% of US investors own Bitcoin. And that number is double for people under 50 and half for those over. It looks like the perception of Bitcoin is moving from risky to safe. A survey from Singapore shows that there's significantly more adoption per capita. They have 58% who own Bitcoin, which shows the US has some catching up to do. So 
Um, you know, I, uh, it's crazy, uh, but yeah, it was like 2% in 2017, it's 6% now. Uh, so we're still in the early stages, relatively speaking, but this is um, right around 1994, 1995 with the internet, uh, adoption is increasing. Um, you know, some, some countries are moving faster than others, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, uh, Ron Paul gift that's happening, right? Quick hits. Bloomberg has some fresh Tether FUD and Tether has responded. And, uh, you know, the, this is based on a story that they said that uh, some Tether people were going to be arrested or something like that. And th this happens every time, um, every few months, it seems like. Um, yeah, nothing has ever come of it. So, I mean, yeah, I, I, I think Tether is fine. <laughs> IMF doesn't recommend that nations should be using Bitcoin as their currency. In other news, a local ice house recommends against the use of refrigerators. Yeah, um, yeah, they have an obvious uh, horse in the race. So yeah, uh, it's not a surprise that they think it's a bad idea to use Bitcoin as a currency. Elizabeth Warren calls Bitcoin developers shadowy super coders. Um, yeah, thanks, I guess. Um, I don't think it's shadowy at all. We're doing all the work out in the open for every, for the whole world to see. Uh, so not shadowy at all. I, I guess she means maybe like anonymous or whatever, but I'm not anonymous. So yeah. Uh, but thanks for calling us super coders though. That's, that's a compliment. You can now mine Bitcoin straight to an IRA. Um, you know, that I, I don't have an IRA, but you know, if you, uh, if you do, that might be interesting. Uh, Nigerian government has its hands full with Bitcoin. Uh, they've been trying to ban Bitcoin or like going against Bitcoin, but of course that's, only making Nigerians want Bitcoin more. Um, but yeah, there, there's a reason why Nigerians want Bitcoin. It's because the Naira is devaluing. Another week, another state thinks BlockFi may be doing something shady. I believe this new state, uh, this state is uh, Kentucky. And yeah, I, they, they're rehypothecating their Bitcoin. I don't think this is a good practice. So we'll see what happens. I will be at the Bitcoin Standard Conference on August 12th to 14th in Ensenada, Mexico, BitBlock Boom in Dallas on August 26th to 29th, and Token 2049 uh, in London, England on October 8th and 9th. Um, uh, yeah, the Programming Blockchain Seminar is in Mexico, August 10th and 11th, uh, and it's a two-day seminar for programmers that want to learn Bitcoin. You can apply, and I have some scholarships available. On this week's Bitcoin fixes this, I talked to Giacomo Zucco about physics, where it's gone wrong and how it's indicative of fiat academia. I read through last week's newsletter, which you can find. I was on Tone Show to talk about shadowy supercoders, tax bills, and much more. And I talked the new book on the theology of business. Yeah, uh, that's Thank God for Bitcoin. The other books are um, The Little Bitcoin Book and uh, Programming Bitcoin, which you can find on Amazon. And lastly, Unchained Capital is a sponsor of this newsletter. I am an advisor. I'm proud to be a part of a company that's enhancing security for Bitcoin holders. If you need multi-sig collaborative custody or Bitcoin native financial services, learn more at unchained.com. Fiat Delenda Est, this song is done.